Thanks, man. Uh, welcome. Thanks for having me Absolutely. on the show. First of all, I want to ask you about uh, the interview you just did. Uh, what's his name? I'm sorry. Oh, this uh, Alan Stern. Yeah. Alan Stern and uh, the New Horizons project. Yeah, he's the Pluto. principal investigator of the mission to Pluto, and he just happened to be coming through town, and we know each other so, from way back, actually. So, I was sitting with him on the couch, and I thought he was just another guest uh, who was going to watch the show, <laughs> and he's uh, literally a rocket scientist. Yeah, yeah, literally, and he uh, he also has an engineering background, so he wasn't only the pure scientist; he knew how to think about the spacecraft when it was being designed. These uh, probes that are going out and taking these amazing pictures. Uh, I mean, years ago, I remember as a kid being fascinated by uh, Viking and, and Voyager. And You're all not that old. And, well, <laughs> I, I, I remember when they were on their way. There you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I remember when they were. It took, it took a while to, uh -huh. uh, to get there. But very fascinated and also so like you, you'd be like, oh, I just wanted a little clearer. Oh. I want to see a little. And now these pictures that are coming back of Pluto are amazing. They leave nothing to the imagination. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they used to be able to say, I think that an alien civilization. <laughs> right, right. It could be that or a clump of rocks exactly. or I don't know. But yep, the, no room for that anymore. Yeah. High definition, full color. It just yeah. looks amazing. And the when you think of the work that goes into just thinking about it and then having the results come back and everything in between, it really kind of makes you uh, have faith again that we're not all stupid people on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> that there's actually amazing things going on. There's hope for the species. Right, what you're there's saying. hope for the species because it just takes an amazing amount of work. You're, you're, I mean... Uh, By the uh, way, it's, it's, it's even more than you're saying because it started decades earlier. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to have a vision. Then you have to convince people that it's got to happen. Then you got to get money for it. Right. And then it's going to be Congress or NASA or whatever. Then you got to find the aerospace partners who are going to build the thing. Then you have to figure out what the science case is. Oh. Then you got to design the, see, we think of the probe as just it's got some camera. No, it is, it is an object that is clad with scientific instruments. <laughs> right? that, that's what we launch. It's an object. Right. And it's got the scientific instruments are attached to it, and that's what flies past Pluto, and you rotate it around, you put things in view. Various you, instruments you various now instruments, are... one, You know, you get the atmosphere and the ground and the mountains and the valleys, you get all the data, and then you beam that sucker back. So... <laughs> and it's just such a, a... I mean, relatively speaking to our mines, it's a... a, a very long distance. Yes, I mean, it's a long distance. And in fact, this particular mission was uh, Pluto so far that if they didn't get it there fast enough, there's a, there's an, there's a time honored rule that it's not written anywhere, but it exists mm -hmm. in science. It's whatever is your experiment, it needs to be finished before you die. Okay. <laughs> that, so, so Pluto is so far away, nobody wanted to be dead before the spacecraft arrived. Right. So it, they shaved as much weight off of it as they could to make it as light as possible and then they gave the hunk the most honkering rockets that existed in the arsenal and mm -hmm. that way it can accelerate quickly yeah and so it got to pluto in in record time and so yeah so that's a in the calculations of, and then we're on a moving object around the sun right pluto is moving around the sun and now you have a moving object to get from a moving object it's to pluto. always amazing so the me. orbital people have to be involved as well some of this was captured in the film martian mm -hmm. just the number of people and their various expertise that needs to come together to make yeah. one thing happen and have it happen the way you could expect. you could did you think you could take martian soil add some human excrement to it for fertilizer and <laughs> nutrients and and uh, grow an earthbound plant on in Martian soil? So the thing is, Martian soil is not really soil mm -hmm. in the way we think of it. If you reach your hand into the soil of Earth, there's all manner of microbes in there that are that are part of an ecosystem. And right. Mars has no ecosystem, so it's just dust. And I'm not, yeah, a, I'm not, a, I'm not a farmer. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you just put seeds and dust and some poop. <laughs> hey, well, and some poop. Maybe it has to stay in the poop itself. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just yeah. saying I'm not the botanist. All right, right. right. <laughs> uh, but but I, I think it was whether or not that could happen as described. I think for the film and the book that preceded it, they did enough science homework. Mm -hmm that you give them the latitude there. Give them the benefit of the doubt yeah. and we'll, uh, we'll enjoy the people, movie. People think um, I just 
criticize movies to no end. I think I'm misunderstood in this regard. I think, I think gravity is the one where people That's are just like, oh, Neil, come on, what are you doing? I say, it's just a movie, yeah. chill out. <laughs> and I think I'm misunderstood. Yeah. I'm calling out things that I thought they could have gotten correct, but didn't. But didn't. A, a. B, they got a thousand other things right. But it's not as interesting to just talk about what a movie that's supposed to get things right got right. Yeah. So I picked <laughs> the things that I thought, and everything I picked was to, in an attempt to, to uh, illuminate some law of physics or some thing so that each tweet that I commented on, I think I would leave you in a, in a new place. Right, right. As an educator, that's what I do. All right. And they say, so it's just a movie. Now, here's my reply to the people who say it's just a movie. Suppose you're watching the Titanic, right? Mm -hmm. And Leonardo DiCaprio comes out and he's got tie-dyed bell bottoms, right? You would cry <laughs> foul. You would fire the, the costume designer. You would say, these people have no clue. Right. This is, get rid of them, and there are no Academy Awards for costume design there. And you would cry foul. You have auto experts who, if a movie's supposed to take place in 1957, and there's a 1955 Chevy, I, I, I mean, it's a 1960 uh, 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 Chevy like in people it. People get angry. You get it. angry. I say, because yeah. it, it takes you out of it if you have this expertise. And so people are denying a scientist the same accent <laughs> to commentary as everybody else has I, I don't I and and imagine you're like a, a fan of Jane Austen style novels and there's a movie and there's a carriage that drives up it's 19th century of course you know, and, and a carriage drives up and there's a the skirt and the whatever that the women wear and and again if somebody uses some term some slang from the 1960s right it takes you out of the moment it looks ridiculous sounds ridiculous and it takes you out of it you're it takes right you out yes, of the moment yes. so why is it okay if they say it it's not okay if I say it. Do you watch movies, science fiction movies? Can you enjoy them? Or are you constantly trying to see where they went awry? You're assuming that because I have more access to the science that they're trying to portray, that somehow it's less entertaining for me. Uh -huh. no, so uh, take, for example, Armageddon, which I, I would say... Armageddon violated more known laws of physics <laughs> yes! than any movie ever made <laughs> before right. or since. Okay? So... I have colleagues who designed entire college courses on the physics it got wrong to then use it as an example of how to get <laughs> the correct physics. So take that film. I still enjoy that movie, right. even though so much of it was just absurd, Yeah, scientifically absurd. It, it, it had a fun script. There was a lot of comedy. Uh, I mean, comedic s situations. Yeah. Uh, Bruce Willis was fun to watch, uh, and his the woman who played his daughter. Um, we all know her. Uh, yeah, uh, Steven Tyler's Steven daughter Tyler's there. Daughter, yeah. Uh, what's uh, her name? Yeah. Liv, Tyler. Liv Tyler. Right, right. So all these characters, and, and Ben Affleck was in there. Yeah. So um, I'm just saying it was an entertaining movie. I could en enjoy it. And but still, ridiculous science. Yeah, it is so ridiculous. I don't spend any time criticizing. <laughs> <laughs> Although, what is it's off, it's off the table. Give me I, I, one. I, give me one completely ridiculous thing from that movie. What well, from from so from Armageddon? Science wise, that's just ludicrous. Because I, I I've watched it and just the everything from the exploding space station and the landing. Why land like a, a an airplane? You could just set. A, you don't have to come in hot. <laughs> you don't have to come in hot. Your wings are useless. No. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> no. Just just set down, match the speed, and set down on it. <laughs> hey, coming in like a rocket. So I would say the fact that they launched two space shuttles. Yeah. They say they retrofitted them for this purpose. But here's the thing. The shuttle itself, uh -huh. which we call the orbiter, that's the thing with the with the stubby wings and the tail fin and where the astronauts sit, and it has the payload, that has no fuel tanks. There's no fuel in that, <laughs> all right? That's why when it launches, all the fuel tanks are exterior to it. Right. So what they did in the movie was they launched it They launched it with some extra fuel tanks, and but then the space shuttle's up there, and then it is do banking maneuvers and things <laughs> as though it had some kind of huge fuel tank. <laughs> yeah. Just because it has nozzles doesn't mean there's fuel connected to it. It was connected to fuel from external nozzles. Right. So the entire launch concept w was flawed. <laughs> the, yeah, they have uh, they have uh, rockets to reposition and and no, no, control I mean, and yeah, yaw, yeah, yeah. but they don't have any of these propulsion, propulsion rockets to, to yeah precisely yeah they can the, the attitude adjustments right, right, right. right very simple bursts of uh, and there's one there's one of these cones pointing in every yeah, yeah. and so you can 
tip that way, but not to sort of take off. Oh, no, not right, taking right, right. off. Yeah, and... Bank a left around Orion. <laughs> 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 I know. I, I I love movies like that, and and uh, time travel movies to me are fascinating because them in and of themselves are flawed because of the the whole paradox issue. Right. So you so out. you give them the flaw and then see how well they work it. There okay. you go. Right. I'll allow you this flaw. Give it to him. Now, how are you going to make it how as believable it? as you can? Exactly. And so that's why Back to the Future is a is a shining example of a lot of energy and attention given to what happens if you go back in time. Various timelines instead timeline. of that linear time where you're jumping around, you're changing things. This is the the theme of Doctor Who, the, the wibbly wobbly timey wimey. That's what <laughs> time is. It's not a thing. It's not a solid linear thing. It's much wigglier than right. that. Yeah. We like I don't I what we like equating time and space. Yes. We like having them as natural partners. Well they are natural partners. Right. But but space is so much more um, tangible, and, and and we can journey around space. Yes, you can Time you can move not... you can move in all the three dimensions of space, yet we are a prisoner in the present. Yeah, on our timeline of life, forever trapped between the past and the future. Isn't that scary? <laughs> That's where we are. I mean, there's Sounds not like much tweet. you can do about it. I think I should tweet that. That is pretty good. You should tweet that. Tweet that. I'll tweet that That's right pretty now. good. Right Someone now. will go, wow, that's genius. And then they'll go, oh, well, I wrote it. <laughs> Jesus, of course. Uh, but but we, we like to imagine that there would be some way we could venture back or forward in time because we have this relationship with time and space and, and we, we traverse space so well. Well, so we don't know yet know how to move within our t back and forth in our time coordinate the way we can move back and forth in our. We just don't know how to do that. We think if you can go to a higher dimension, then that would be easy to do, and that was portrayed in the film Slaughterhouse Five in the book right, Slaughterhouse yeah, Five yeah. by Kurt Vonnegut. Mm -hmm. So the main character is picked up by aliens, and he's asking, "Well, when is it?" He said, "It's always then." Right. right. There's a whole mismatch of vocabulary because our words that we ascribe to time do not embrace the possibility that time is always happening mm -hmm. at all times, that you're always being born, you're always dying, you're always sitting at this desk. Right. Just you, whatever, whatever present moment you happen to occupy at any, at any time. But your entire timeline is already laid out for there you. There are occupy. infinite present moments on yes. a timeline. Infinite present moments. That's so right. once it passes, it was still there, and the ones that if haven't happened. If you can step yet, out of it and see the right, entire and coordinate. See it. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, and, and it brings some interesting facts. For example, uh, if you could step into a fourth dimension, these walls that surround us in the studio, there's, there's a ceiling floor, left, right, uh, top, bottom, six sides. If you had access to a fourth dimension, you could step into the fourth dimension, exit this space without opening a window or a door, and then step back into our world outside the out. So this would be the best way to escape a prison. Uh, right. Just access the fourth dimension. Inside the walls, outside the walls. Now Correct. You just walk away. You just walk away. Oh. And now think about it. Time is essentially a fourth dimension. Mm. There was a time before they put you in the cell wall. In the in the prison, right? Oh, there so, you go. So you just go back, back to that before you were in the prison, and then you rejoin yourself, and you're not in prison. But you're not, and you're also not of the past. You're just you're just reoccupying that moment, occupying that present. moment, but as the present. Right. But you got out of prison at that, that is point. Great. Right. So it's a, it's so it works for time oh, as well. Oh, they better start working on that over at Rikers. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, here's an interesting concept I was thinking about. Someone uh, figures that out. Rikers, they don't belong in prison. Yeah, they belong yeah. In... Then they don't. Yeah. <laughs> they... Give them a pardon. I think uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's worth that's it. Pardonable. Worth the pardon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, uh, uh, as as far as traveling through time physically uh, and thinking the impossibility of that. Um, all right, that's one thing. How about the fact that people are thinking about this this folding over of space, traversing great distances through a wormhole, black hole, what have you, then having that distance and now looking back at somewhere that is a million light years away you would see because you traverse that distance so quickly you would be able to gaze upon a million years ago yes in fact you would be able to see yourself right in initiate that trip 
Now that's pretty <laughs> crazy stuff right there. I don't mean to blow your mind that's this, 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 this late in the day. <laughs> but yeah, it would be, uh, you would, because you would beat the light beam right to arrive now i had a similar sort of conversational exchange with dc comics and i don't want to bore you with the whole long story but they wanted superman to visit the hayden planetarium where i work that's my day job and superman in the comic strip they wanted him to visit to observe through our special uh, projectors and telescopes to observe the destruction of krypton oh okay and because and i said oh okay well how old is superman and they said, well, he's eternally in his late 20s. <laughs> all right, I, I don't know if you knew that. He's yeah, a, I didn't know that. Eternally in his late 20s. So, all right. I said, well, when he arrived on Earth, he was an infant, no older than when he left Krypton. Mm -hmm. So either he traveled on a beam of light for which time does not pass. You don't age if you travel at this. They're aliens, so they have power to do whatever. Sure. So, so travel at the speed of light. He arrives here, Moses style, just as he was launched, unaged. Fine, but if that happened, he's traveling with the light of the destroyed planet. Mm -hmm. So, because that's also traveling at the speed of light. Right. So, so he would not get to come here, wait 27 years, and see the destruction of his planet. Oh, no, it would be 27 to, years too late. He, he'd be 27 years too, too late, so he's got to beat the light beam. So I said, the only way this can happen is if you give him a wormhole, and he gets here instantly on a wormhole. Now the, he's here still as an infant, and the light is still taking 20 Still taking its time. So I found DC Comics, a star, a red star, because Krypton is a red star, 27 light years away. And I said, let this be henceforth the origin of Superman. And so now it's in the Superman lore. Uh, so Action Comics number 14, it's in there if you want to find I it. I wonder why no one ever I'm very proud of that. that he, that I, I, that he never proud of it. It was, it was, black it was, it was a, a wormhole. It was a, it was a, a serious collaboration with the storytellers. Of, yeah, of yeah, that putting bit. some some science theory exactly. behind a, a fantasy story like right, that. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I wonder why no one came up with that going through a wormhole beforehand because he did come there. He was the exact age or yeah, similar age. Yeah, having that distance... If he's still, you know, if you've ever had kids, you'll know. If you photograph them two months later, they're different from when you just uh -huh. two months earlier. Yeah, yeah. So when they're that young, months make a difference. So, so I don't know how long it took him, but it wasn't very long. And then why did he just age until late twenties and then kind of stop? No, because all the stories are drawn from that time. Uh huh. Yeah, it's not like oh, ten years later, he's ten years older. It's ten years later. We're still we're still telling stories. Will he get old? Will it be old Superman if you I, did? I, I, th I thought I asked huh. them that. And it would be something senior citizen Superman. Senior citizen <laughs> Superman. It's like, yeah, you know, yeah. Saving the aged from... Beating people with his hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's, uh, that's interesting. The... Uh... The big, uh, the big uh, news today, of course, Einstein's. Look at you, was sitting in front of you. You got every. Oh, we got, got David all Bowie. You got OJ. You got Bowie, a little OJ. There's some, um, a couple arrested, apparently having sex on that big uh, Ferris wheel in Vegas that they made. You had to know that was going to happen. Of course, if you, of course. people do it on airplanes for the Mile High Club. Yeah, we got a woman. By the way, about the Mile High Club, mm -hmm. it occurred to me. Of course, any air. Well, mile high is not very high for an airplane. Right. You're still ascending or descending, and you're not really supposed to be in the bathroom for that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So the Mile High Club in Denver, of course, that's Mile High City. So anyone who has sex above the Mile High line, which they have marked in the stadium, mm -hmm. is the row of seats that is 5,280 feet above sea level, <laughs> they can all justifiably claim they're in the Mile High Club. Mile High that's Club. You could have sex on the at the gate. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> on a plane and say that you're in the Mile High Club. Yeah, no, I think uh, uh, at the gate, yes. Oh, Yo, yes. Yeah. So you can still do it in the plane. In the plane. Marked. And you say, yeah, we were in a plane and right. I joined the Mile High Club. Mile High Club. There you go. If you want to be technical about it. Technical. And I, I will authorize that yes. claim. <laughs> All right. Next time, uh, take a trip to Denver. Yeah. Uh, Einstein's gravitational waves detected in scientific milestone. Um, what What is this? What has led up to this? And how was it finally uh, discovered? This was just announced hours ago. Yeah. So you don't miss anything here. Look at you. No, I saw that it popped up as an alert on my phone. Yeah, I was as like, it's oh, okay. This yeah, is it's 100 good. years in the, in the making here. Oh. Einstein, 100 years ago, uh, oh, 98 years ago, I think it was, gave a recipe for a prediction of how gravity, how you might be able to detect the kind of gravity that he described mm -hmm. in his famous 1916 paper. To him, gravity was not a force of attraction between objects, as Newton 
would have you think of it. Gravity is the distortion in the fabric of space and time. Uh. And if I have a massive object, I'm distorting it deeply, and some other object comes in the vicinity, it kind of falls into that distortion. Right. So you're really just staying with the flow. And I think it was uh, one of Einstein's disciples who came up with the phrase, mass tells space how to curve. I, I gotta say this right. No, it's, it's very <laughs> pithy, excuse me. Um, don't worry, you got me. No, matter tells <laughs> here. matter tells space how to curve. Space tells matter how to move. Oh, okay. There you go. And so now, if you have a disturbance in this fabric of space and time, it will emanate forth as a ripple moving at the speed of light. And that ripple that was discovered and, and announced today has been traveling through the fabric of space and time for 1.3 billion years. And it is the record of the collapse of a double black hole system coalescing into one black hole. And that is a major disturbance in the fabric of so space. So in order for that to be detected, it would have had to have been this giant, like obviously anything probably throws off gravitational waves. Yes, anything. Then to make it Correct. To reach here. It's gotta be big enough and bright. Right, right, right. Bright enough, if I can use like that word. A tsunami of gravity. Correct, and so black hole, badass black holes coalescing is what did it. And in fact, in the last instant before these black holes coalesce, it is radiating so much energy, it is more energy than all the stars of the universe oh combined. But it only does it for a quick fraction of a second it's enough before to, they coalesce. But it's enough to give good. that little jiggle, wait a billion, point three years, and, and it came across the detectors, changing the length between two mirrors that are suspended on very thin wires in multiple observing locations in the world. And by the way, you know how much the length changed as the ripple went across? Yeah. A fraction the diameter of an atomic nucleus. It is the most it is the most precise measurement ever made by far. That's detectable. Of anything. Yes. With a mechanical yes. 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 setup. Yes. And in fact, they the yeah. insulation of this I, I, visited, I believe that, I guess I don't leave them out like wind chimes. I know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I visited one of these facilities just a month ago in Louisiana. There, there's one there, there's one in Hanford, uh, Washington State, and they're building others around the world so that you don't want to detect it only in one. You want to make sure multiple ones right. detect it, just in, no, there's no funny business or there's, you can have confidence if you have the exact signal in more than one detector right. that it's real. All right, so so I'm there and you, you come up, you drive up to the facility says, uh, beam on, drive slowly, <laughs> or something. They don't, yeah, any vibration will affect this thing. Uh, vibrations on a level that is so so sensitive, you say it can detect the quantum vibrations of molecules in the wire that's holding the, oh the mirror. God. Oh my How God. is that accounted for? Well, so now they got to account for it. I mean, it's a very and What about seismic stuff that's unpredictable? Well, so yeah, it's one of the world's greatest seismic detectors. As I well. bet. <laughs> so no, there are, ways yeah. to, there are ways to insulate it from whatever's going on. In, around, in, so it's it's a masterpiece of engineering. Amazing, yeah. Yeah, and it'll Nobel Prize is all around for everybody, yeah. I, I gather, so wh what is, now what does this mean? We always hear how important these discoveries are. Uh, what what will this teach us? Well, it is, <laughs> uh, it is. I don't know that there's anything left that Einstein predicted that we can still end up finding out is true. Everything has been correct. And in fact, let me tell you how Amazing. smart Einstein was. Uh, in one of his equations, he put in a term that he later regretted putting in, and he called it his greatest blunder. <laughs> this is a term that he looked at his equations, and his equations showed that the universe had to be either expanding or collapsing. Right. Now, no one had any idea that the universe, which is everything, would be doing anything. Yeah, it's just there. It's just there, right? right? So he says, this can't be right. Let me put in this term. It's a legitimate mathematical term, but physically, what the hell are you doing, Albert? And he says, this term will help stabilize it from collapse, okay? And it's a pressure force to push outward, and that'll stabilize it. Later on, year, just a couple of years later, Hubble, the man, yeah. after whom the telescope was the named, telescope the man. <laughs> discovered that, in fact, the universe was expanding, and he didn't need the term. Because he could have predicted that the universe should either be expanding or catching, but he didn't. He put in this term. He said it's his biggest blunder. Now, you know what Einstein's actual biggest blunder is? 
saying that that was his biggest uh, blunder. Yeah. <laughs> because in fact, in 1998, we discovered a pressure in the universe pressing against gravity that is exactly the term that he put in. It wound up being what he said. His not, biggest not a blunder, at blunder all. is thinking he made a blunder. Uh huh. That's how smart how, he is. Wh that, that is badass smart. Who was his closest uh, competitor, if you could even use that word, back back in, in those no days? I mean, Isaac Newton. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, in his time, nobody. He didn't have a contemporary. No. No, they're really smart people at the time. The, the discoverers of quantum physics and, and there's a guy named Eddington. They're very smart people, but none of them rivaled Einstein. And you got to go back in time to, uh, uh, to Newton. Which, Isaac Newton. And I think to find when, someone who rivals his intellect. And when you look at people that rivaled his intellect back then, I mean, knowledge of the universe wasn't all that uh, reliable. Yeah. Uh, so, so I don't know. You, it's amazing that Newton was able to come up with what he came up with then. Yeah. In so those days. This is what makes towering geniuses towering geniuses. They don't make little incremental progress on whoever came before. They make huge progress. Right. And there's a there's an old saying. There's a quote from Newton that says, if I can see farther than others, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if you ever really study Newton and then everybody else around him, we really need to restate that. So if I can see farther than others, it's because I'm surrounded by midgets. Okay. <laughs> I mean, he really was not simply standing on shoulders of giants. He was the giant. Mm -hmm. Period. Unquestioned. So, so for me, I would rank Newton very high, Einstein a moderately distant second, and everybody else that is famous as scientists a distant third to him. Mm -hmm. That would be Feynman and Eddington and Niels Bohr and Schrodinger and all, a lot of names. Each one of them got Nobel Prizes for major discoveries made back in the first part of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, Einstein was was kicking ass. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around the uh, uh, mass, matter, a planet, uh, not having a, a force, but bending space so that things kind of roll into it. Well, it's, it they, roll into that, it. They, they roll into it. They like if, roll into they it. They roll into it. But, but what's, uh, why then does, does it actually seem to be adhering to the planet itself and not rolling just off of it? Well, so what, <laughs> <laughs> so what we, when we speak of this curvature of space and time, it is the sort of the field that surrounds the object. But if you're on the object, then you're you're not moving. You've you've touched the object. Is it literally like trying to matter is in the hill? way? No, no. If if Earth were not if if Earth were not in the way, right? A way to think of it, take Earth, shrink it down to a point in this in its center. Then that would continue on a curved space time trajectory and then hit the center of the Earth at the center mm -hmm. when it finally got there. So so it's it would want to do that. And in fact, I could tip it to the side and it'll and it'll, it'll keep, keep going right to fall. Which is why over time, valleys fill in and mountains get lower, because they the high places try to get to the low places, regardless of what it's made of. They're, they're just always trying following. To they're just following there. And the reason when you jump up that you come back down, it, is it is it like trying to crawl up a slide almost? Yes, exactly. So <laughs> you didn't escape Earth because you didn't give yourself enough energy to 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 ascend out of this uh, gravitational well, right. if you will. And in a black hole, the gravitational well basically has vertical sides, <laughs> so you're not getting yeah, out. Yeah, you're not you're ever, not, ever you're getting out of it. I love hearing the theories of what would happen if you uh, kind of, uh, the closer you get to a black hole, and this stretching that oh, the spaghettification is good. I wrote a whole book called Death by Black Hole. <laughs> it's Yeah, yeah. If, you, if I'm going to die, that's how I'm going to die. Because that's, just... that's got to be more interesting than getting hit by a bus. <laughs> I always wonder, though, it's like, I don't think you'd make it that far to realize, like, <laughs> well, I'm spaghetti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It must happen well, no, very what, quickly. <laughs> well, what happens is, so these are what the forces would have you do if you were, like, Elastic Man or, right. or Gumby. But since we are, you, you do stretch a little bit. But as this, these forces want to stretch you, what happens is you will, the stretching force will exceed, at one point, will exceed the intermolecular forces that bind your flesh. Oh, boy. 
So there's a point where the upper half of your body will snap away from the lower <laughs> half of your body. And then those two halves will snap into two pieces. Right. They'll snap into two pieces. So because we are not rubber, we will snap into multiple pieces rather than stretch. Yeah. And then this will just continue until you're a stream of atoms descending into the cosmic abyss. Yeah. And that's not even the worst part. <laughs> you are also funneled down to a narrower and narrower uh, thread. Oh, boy. So, so you are not only stretched head to toe, you're squeezed side to side. So you are, it, it's, a better word is that you're being extruded through the fabric of space. Right. Like toothpaste through a tube. Just kind of, and then once you reach the center of this, what's there and no, what no. happens? It's the, it's the mathematical limit of Einstein's uh, uh -huh. theories of gravity. So we know there is a limit to that. And there are people trying to marry gravi uh, gravitational theory to quantum theory, because when the large is small, we have a theory for the small, it's quantum physics. That's the mm -hmm. foundation of all of IT technologies. The creation, storage, and retrieval of information is traceable to innovations in and, and applications of quantum physics. Mm -hmm. So I say we just discovered gravity waves, and you say, well, what's the application of that? I have no idea. <laughs> well, if you were around 80 years ago, I say, I just discovered that atoms do weird things under weird situations. And you would say, what's the application? I said, I have no idea, but it's kind of cool. But how do I make, but it's kind of cool. But that, well, I'm not going to fund it next time because you're not putting food on my plate. Right. Meanwhile, it, yes, it took 60 years, but innovative applications of these weird properties of atoms right. and nuclei doctor industry all of that yeah yeah all of that wow and by some measures it is accounts for one third of the world's gdp in the economies the storage the creation storage and retrieval of information mm -hmm. uh where do you uh where do you stand with the uh, the american space program right now how do you feel about it do you feel that we've kind of slacked off uh, do you feel I don't we're take doing stands. Well? Yes, where do I stand? I don't stand. I don't stand. You don't stand. Yeah, I, I observe. I don't take. Observe. Stands. Yeah, I don't take stances. Uh, but as as a, a person and and as an American, how do you feel about the American space program? Yeah. So so I'm a little annoyed. Yeah. That to get to the space station that we built, exactly. We right. have to hitch a ride with the Ruskies. Yeah. Yeah. Our you know forty year sworn enemy. Yeah. The Ruskies, right? <laughs> Back from 1945 to when did the, uh, maybe when the wall came down, whenever they yeah, started the, the Cold War, yeah, yeah to, to 1989. So we, and, excuse me, we're not hitching a ride. We're buying seats. Buying? Oh, yeah. They're not, not just I, picking us up. So that's a little embarrassing, I think. Isn't but it? I, I could, I, I, every day I try to take the high road and say, and I hold hands, let's hold hands, I say, Come here. So that is cooperation in space. Cooperation. <laughs> <laughs> that, that gets uh, us out of it, right? That was good. We're cooperating with We're the Russians. Cooperating Russian. <laughs> with the Russians. Yes, it's, it's, we sing kumbaya, and that's how you do it. One, one thing I've noticed, though, uh, it, it's getting the private sector involved a lot more in space. No, so that's actually a misconception. It is. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Well, screw me. No, I knew, no, no. I knew I'd wreck it. It's not a bad, it's a mild misconception. <laughs> NASA has always used the uh, uh, space companies for everything. Mm -hmm. The LEM, you know, the, the, the lunar excursion module, oh, yeah. that's the thing that landed on the moon. From and, uh, out on Long uh, exactly. Island. Exactly. They designed, built, manufactured in Bethpage, Long Island, that where Grumman Aerospace was found. Yeah. And to this day, people still walk proudly. Oh, it was a very proud thing oh, for Long man. Island. They had man. An, if oh, it wasn't boy. your uncle or your mother or your Somebody worked somebody over Somebody in your family worked over at Grumman. And they wouldn't tell you they worked in the aluminum canoe uh, department. <laughs> like, no, I work over at Grumman. Oh, the lunar module. I'm making canoes. <laughs> I didn't know they made canoes. <laughs> they did, yeah. Oh, aluminum gosh. canoes. Why do you even know that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I was very proud of Grumman back uh, when I was a kid. <laughs> Uh, actually, I'm a fan of canoeing. I like the aluminum canoes because they had a flotation uh, bits in the nose and in the yeah, tail. Can... And you flip it over and that you can breathe inside of right. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, yeah. I, I knew about <laughs> it. Uh, SpaceX. Uh... Right. So the difference today is now SpaceX and other companies are designing the vehicle on their own investments on the hope and expectation that NASA will say, I want to go to the moon. Who's got the spacecraft for me? Gotcha. And then we just buy the spacecraft from you, and then you sell me the spacecraft. It's, it was always the. But it should have. It should have been that from the beginning. How many times do we have to fly our own NASA spacecraft to low Earth orbit, right? <laughs> can I get a cargo? Can you please build me one so I don't have to do this? Does the post office have 
U.S. post office airplanes? No, they fly mail in the belly of Delta Airlines or whoever. And you get, you let the corporate thing do the routine tasks. Right, right. And so when- but I mean, it hasn't been till recently where a routine task is low Earth orbit, so. Well, no, no, well, no, I'd say since the 80s. Yeah, no. to, to get the private sector up to speed for the actual launch vehicle. But that should have been promoted early on. Yeah, That's yeah. That's my point. Do you really need six astronauts and a space shuttle to carry cargo to a crew in the International Space Station? Yeah, let that, hap let that happen separately. Autonomous. Uh, right, exactly. So automation is a major uh, uh, feature of modern space exploration. I think that's something that uh, this decade, actually, has really stepped up autonomy. The, the, the way... Uh, autonomous well, AI is coming drones. in. Drones. AI is coming yes, in. Yes. AI is better than ever before. And the computers that are able to, as I play with these things all the time and I get crap for it constantly. The way, like, even just uh, uh, consumer drones, little toy quadcopters, huh? the uh, way they can coordinate GPS with various sensors. Uh, on the, the device and your remote control where you can pick waypoints and have it fly to various It's waypoints. AI, and, and next is, 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 is driverless cars. Right. That's next. So, so finally, the, the computing software is matching the miniaturization yeah. and the automation of the electronics and to do things that you now would want it to do that are not so blunt as, oh, I, my, my coffee maker turns itself on in the morning. Yeah. I remember that was a big thing. It was huge. The TV commercials, <laughs> the coffee will be ready for you when you come up. Oh my gosh, I gotta get that. And I think it was actually a mechanical device on a clock. Oh yeah, the trip, the trip, on the it thing. Or something. Not it, electronic, just Yeah, not, not electronic at all. Yeah, steampunk <laughs> <the> coffee maker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I've always been fascinated with uh, looking decade to decade as to what technology is attributed to that decade because one usually stands out and uh i think uh like the 2000s to 2010 it was just computing mm -hmm. you know compute getting processing speeds up and and you know coming up with the likes of these devices and then we're looking now well, wasn't at that this... when when did uh, watson beat the Jeopardy champion. Oh, right. Was that in the 2000s? I think that was in the 2000s, yeah. yeah. It was only if, like if, if not, within five years ago. When, when, when is he, your crack team of researchers, what did they Yeah, yeah. What are they saying? <laughs> but uh, I think it was in the 90s, Deep Blue beat yes. Gary Kasparov in chess. Right. So we invent a game. We crown our own champions. We write a computer that beats our champion at the game yeah. that we invent. The game that okay? we invented. So, uh, by the way, the world didn't come to an end when that happened. All these people no, no. fear AI that's going to take over. No, I mean, there are plenty of benchmarks that have been met. People are still uh, predicting the demise of, of our cells because we, we create this artificial uh, I, I bring it on. I want all the AI. <laughs> I, could, I, uh, I remember a movie years ago called Future Shock. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. in the 70s, and it, it just scared the hell out of people because <laughs> they thought, uh, you know, robots were going to kind of take over. Right. Plus, nobody makes robots. What, robots are a pointless thing. If it you're really going to make a robot, it's going to be a machine specific to a task, <laughs> right? Do the robots that, put, that uh, assemble cars right. in Detroit, do they look like anything that's just going to come walking out? To, yeah. Out to... <laughs> I must kill you. I must. It's like I must weld you, and then like the wrist will move. And I am fascinated by how quickly those things move and how They're precise. Good. They're good. They could lay something on. I watch uh, how how is it made? Those great show. Those great shows. Show. And just the machines that are used. Uh, it's that's amazing. AI. That's in a, yeah. That's AI. But we're not. But we don't need the, we're, the claws on exactly. the robot with the arms and legs yeah, yeah, and a head. Warning. It has warning. To have Will a Robinson. Humanoid shape to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, your robots will be very specific in their task. Uh, the Hubble telescope is a robot. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, don't don't know, look like a person. Doesn't look like a person. And <laughs> so I don't, they'll never look like people. They don't have to. Yeah. That's yeah. What I'm saying. It's impractical. And look at the blade that people with no legs run on in the sprint. Right. Does that look like human feet? It look like, that, a, looks yeah. like a spatula. It looks like a spatula. And it's the it's, and so if you're going to build a running thing, it's going to be designed one way. You want to build right. a computing thing, you do it another Something way. Something more so, aesthetic. It would. So be, I think uh, people are overreacting. Yeah. Yeah, as yeah. they do for every impending scientific advance. Isn't it, uh, well, do, how much do you blame on the media for kind of throwing stuff at people saying, this you should be afraid of, and oh my God, this is scary. Not so much the media, I think movies do that. And by the way, I don't have a problem with movies uh, portraying apocaly apocalyptic futures. I love those My, my favorite quote 
I'm going to I'm going to paraphrase it because I'm not going to know it exactly. Uh, Ray Bradbury mm. was asked as the, as the story was told to me. He was asked, was it the press asked him, why is it you depict such horrific futures? Uh, don't you have a more positive outlook? He said, ma'am, I write these uh, apocalyptic futures so that you will know to avoid them. Oh, OK. So that was good. Like, uh, that was he's, good. He's helping out. He's helping out. <laughs> Here's a future you don't want. We, uh, we went through a, a time where we were sure we were going to blow ourselves up. And every movie, I mean, uh, there was the post apocalyptic, post war. Now, now, now I, don't e I don't story. equate these two because one of them would be the acts of irresponsible politicians. Right. And that would not be a new discovery about the conduct of politicians. Science, however, we're moving a frontier, and the fear factor is scientists create something that we cannot control. Mm -hmm. That's the fear. A nanobot, a virus, a, uh, you know, this is the premise of, of uh, Planet of the Apes. Right, yeah. There's some virus that got created and escaped, and we all, the humans, went extinct. Right, the, the new one. And the, the, the new one. They, they fleshed out the story a little more thoroughly. Yeah, yeah, yeah a little yeah. more than just Chuck Heston walking around going, <laughs> what happened? What the hell happened here? <laughs> I love the original one though. That's it's your uh, stinking pile <laughs> of me, you, you damn, damn dirty you. ape. And then, damn you all to hell, you <laughs> blew it up. He's very angry. Statue of Liberty shot. Yep. Classic. Classic. Yeah. Uh, what about what about a a uh, celestial body impacting with the Earth? How uh, do we have it's anything real. that it's we're real. happens all the time? We plow through three hundred tons of meteor meteors a day. Now most of it burns up harmlessly and and gently descends to earth. Yeah. But in there occasionally you get some big ones. And yeah, yeah, you want to talk about how recently I guess in India was it uh, supposedly got struck by uh, a meteor. Yeah, no, he didn't. Uh, he didn't. He died, but he didn't die from a meteor. No. Oh, okay, cuz I heard it came through the house or something or, or it hit No, no, no. So, no, no, so it blew up. Okay, so so they wanted to blame it on a meteor. <laughs> yeah. I'm reading this story. And then they described the crater. The crater was like like some amount deep and a certain amount wide. That's not it didn't seem big enough. No, 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 no. Craters are like wide. They are wide for their depth. Right. Not deep for their oh, width. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So sorry, there's nothing. And everyone said that they found some rock and the rock was hot. Actually, meteors that fall are cold. They've been sitting in freaking space <laughs> their whole life. They're like at near absolute zero temperature. A journey through the atmosphere, it gets hot very quickly on the outer edge. Uh -huh. but not hot enough to get through to the center. And so generally frost will show up on a meteor. So pe generally people don't know this and they want to pretend like, or they want to try to fool you into thinking it, was, it, it looked like a subsurface buried bomb. In movies, it's always like uh, kind of smoking and hot and red. Hot and red. Yeah. So it makes a better movie story, but it's not real. So it's some kind of... Something I would tweet about. If like somebody, a mine or a yeah, explosive Yeah, it was definitely a, a buried explosive. Definitely a buried Oh, okay. All right. Well, don't blame the meteors then. Yeah, yeah. Don't blame... Uh, Bobo, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, I had a question. How soon are we on track for our next generation of space vehicle yeah it's it a, seems, gr a great seems, question Bobo asked a great question i was hoping it would have been long ago before this question like you know when like right when we retired the last shuttle yeah you know there were tears shed when the last shuttle came it's the end of an era people teared up and and they they believe they were crying because it was the end of an era and i think i know better why they were crying than they do were you tearing up? It was uh, an emotional moment. Let me tell moment. you, excuse me, it should not have been an emotional moment. You know, did you, any of you tear, you're old enough because you've sure. revealed this to me. Uh, did you tear up when the last Gemini mission flew? Uh, no. And you no. know why? Uh, because the Saturn V rocket was sitting on an adjacent launch pad. Very excited we, for the we, Apollo program, I'm yes. done with Gemini. We did the experiments we need. The moon awaits us. Yeah via the Saturn V rocket. So the sadness was not that we ended the shuttle program, but that there wasn't a next generation of launch And after vehicles. Apollo, and there was the launch shuttle. Pad, where months later you would then take take it up into We're space. We're excited about the shuttle after Apollo. Apollo Even though program. that was still a big delay, but yes. Yeah, yeah, it was, but I, I mean, I had heard about- It was a new thing that you could get excited was, about. Yeah, you could get excited about, yeah. but now so, uh, nothing. So there's new, what they call launch architecture that would get us back to the moon, not quite to Mars. So, and NASA is slowly but steadily testing that 
And there's a budget that was just announced yesterday or the day before that continues the funding of these new launch vehicles. But, you know, I wish it were faster, you know, and I wish they, there was more research in, mm. in propulsion that maybe, you know, exotic propulsion. So right, because we're so always long. just dumping fuel into yeah, a... Just, just burning fuel. Yeah, burning fuel, something new. Yeah. I, I think from Earth... Robert Goddard would be embarrassed to learn. That they were still... A century after yeah, his liquid yeah. fuel rocket. Hey, guys, what do you have today? Well, we got liquid fuel rockets, you know. It doesn't seem like we have many ideas for from Earth to low orbit. It seems like we have a lot of ideas, at least, for low orbit to out into uh, uh, outer space yeah, and, so and various other planets. These would be like uh, low, th there are these low impulse drives where yeah. you send out sort of um, uh, ions and you will recoil, mm -hmm. but it's very efficient, but it doesn't, you can't do it quickly. So this is good for like long-term cargo transport where you would send the cargo ahead. Right. Way, I don't weigh down your spacecraft. Mm -hmm. By the way, if I send you up in a spacecraft, it's going to be what they call man rated. So it has, it'll be safe for humans to ride. Do I need a spacecraft safe for humans to ride that's carry Cheerios? <laughs> no. <laughs> Put that in another craft. <laughs> yeah. Rate that craft differently. It'll be cheaper. It'll, you can send it faster. You go higher G forces. Mm hmm. Uh, you don't want a bunch of dust in there, though. <laughs> you like you your Cheerios. Little, you got, can't have a bunch of just crumpled Cheerios. It, yeah, we had about 10,000 Gs on this thing. The uh, I, I I do like the Did idea. Have somebody coming in at five? Uh, yeah, they were, they were supposed to. I don't know. Is she out there? Yeah, she's oh, out no. there. Oh my gosh! God, Esther's out there. We have oh. a we do have a question from your nephew. Oh, Neil. my nephew had a question. Okay, he's there. He is. He's on the screen. Go ahead. Hi, Neil. Uh, hello. What is Graham's number? <laughs> uh, yeah. I I only learned what Graham's number is today. Today, really? my colleague told me about Graham's number, and it's some huge number that is so large you can't even write out the digits of it in all of the available space of the universe. Yeah, there's not enough space in the universe to write out. That's what I was told today. I don't have independent verification of that, but a very reliable source shared it with me, a colleague of mine who uh -huh. thinks deeply about these matters. So, yeah. but I love large numbers that have names. There's a Google, right. which is one with a hundred zeros. And that number is a bigger number than the number of atoms in the universe. So, so you don't really need numbers much bigger than that. Big That's number. a big number. Yeah. In fact, it's way bigger than the number of atoms in the universe itself, about one with 81 zeros. Mm -hmm. So then you have 10 raised to the Google power. That's a Googleplex, and that's my favorite. That's anybody's favorite number. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a one that has a Google zeros. Oh, uh, wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're that's... taking the first number, and that's how many zeros. Like Googleizing it. Googleizing the Google. Yeah, yeah exactly. Holy smoke. That's so cool. Thank, uh, thank your nephew for yeah, that. Yeah, that was my nephew. He uh, recorded that. Oh, he, oh, oh he recorded that. Science. Okay. Yeah, he's yeah. a big. Uh, what I will tell him is fan. if he likes big Loves numbers, planets. there's a book I read when I was his age. It was a fun book. It's called Mathematics and the Imagination Ooh. by Edward Kasner and another guy named Newman. I forgot his first name. And Newman. one of their nephews named the number Google. Really? Yes. That's a pretty. Uh, yes. Big thing. Age 11 or something. Legacy. That's a fun book. There's a whole chapter on big numbers in there, and I love uh, it. He was, he was over my house the other day, and uh, we put on the G Gear VR virtual reality goggles and uh, put this uh, kind of a tour of the solar system. Oh, good. And uh, he loved it. It just it really looks amazing. You're mm -hmm. kind of going around the planets. They all have their various moons, and you could uh, kind of check it out. I like the direction that uh, virtual reality is going in as far as being able to experience now, you know why I never things. really liked virtual reality? I'm, a out, I'm an outlier here, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not here to try to change people's minds. But personally, VR is so personal. Mm. Now, I know they're trying to make it so other people are in your, in I your would, experience. I would, yeah. yeah. Gaming so maybe is that would, time for that. Yeah, I guess it is. But in the, in the traditional usage of VR where you have your lone experience, as an educator, I value the interpersonal experience and the mm -hmm. shared experience. And so... Uh, yeah, that, and in the Planetarium Dome at the Hayden Planetarium here in New York. Oh, that is an amazing we, 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 it, community it's a, experience. It's, it's a community yeah. experience. It's like th theater in the round. It's like a campfire experience. But when you're facing one direction, and even in a movie theater, it's just you in the movie. It's not right. you and everybody else in the movie. So I yeah, like... Yeah, you're I, kind of... Uh, yeah, yeah. When, when you're in the round, everybody's is, is sharing a common... 
Uh, some of my favorite times when I was a kid uh, and, and things I still remember very vividly was going to uh, the Museum of Natural History, the Hayden mm -hmm. Planetarium. I've heard of Those, it. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> Those great uh, field trips when we'd go out from Long Island and yep. come out here to the big city. And it was just such an amazing, wondrous magic. Uh, thing it was magic. to do. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Neil, thanks so much for uh, coming Well, excellent. And uh, do people know you, you lend us your studio and we do Star Talk yes, in your Star studio? Yes, Star Talk, right? From so here, kind of, yeah, it's great to, to share space. And it's nice to come in. And sit down, eat something, and learn a little something. Too. It's uh, there. It is. Yeah, Star Talk uh, Radio Show with Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's available everywhere and uh, on StarTalkRadio.net. Uh, and get the whole listing there. Yeah, it's on oh, yeah. Sirius XM. Yeah, yeah, Sirius XM everywhere. It's a uh, fantastic. And, and we jump species to television. It was the first talk show ever on science for television. Yeah, and so it's on National Geographic. So very cool, yeah, man. Yeah. So thanks.